Well, the biggest failure, I believe, of the healthcare system is it's not consistent uh, and it's not fair. I'll give an example of a patient that I saw yesterday in the surgery clinic. It was unbelievable. A gentleman with type 1 diabetes who uh, didn't have any money for his insulin. So he decided, well, he didn't decide, he didn't have any money for his insulin. So he went to, to diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a really bad problem where you basically develop acid in your blood. He got abdominal compartment syndrome from that. The abdominal compartment syndrome led to an open laparotomy. He had a discontinuity of his bowel for months. He was in the ICU for two months so bad that he had an ulcer on the back of his head because he laid back so long. This is an 18-year-old kid, by the way. Uh, he finally survived. They put him back together. Uh, he's got... He's got skin over his abdomen, no, no fascial layers, nothing connecting him. You can see his guts through his skin. Uh, and he's better, all for the want of some insulin. This was like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in the ICU for two months because he didn't have enough money for insulin. Now, that is what gets me so angry about this, that I could have given him the $50 for the insulin, and I will take the million dollars and use that for something else. This is what's so crazy about our country is that um, bad choices. Here we traded $50 for, worth of insulin, for a million dollars worth of care, and nobody would make that trade, yet we do it every day. Tony Drummond, 51 years old. I'll be 52 at the end of this month. I'm a diabetic. I'm below the knee, amputee on my right leg. I have a high blood pressure. Right before my baby was born, it was in 1997, probably about June, July of 1997, I went to a doctor and they told me I was diabetic. They had put me in intensive care because my blood sugar was like 900. When they first was talking about my leg, they told me I wasn't getting good circulation. And so they gave me one surgery where they took the bangs out of this leg and tried to put them in this one. Then it didn't work. Then I got a sore right in the middle of this leg. Instead of getting better, it got worse. Kept getting worse, kept getting worse. That was after the surgery. And uh, he said, and I remember the, uh, the vascular doctor told me, he said, we may have to take it off. I said, no. I said, you're not going to take my leg off. I can, I can live with a little sore. You're not going to take my leg off. And after a while, it started hurting more. And then they went in and did another surgery on it, which I had a lot of staples on my leg. Went around a lot of staples on it for a while. And it just swelled up one night. And it looked like the staples were just bursting. I had to go to the emergency room that night. And they came in and told me if I didn't take it off, I probably wasn't going to be able to leave because the blood clot that was right here I mean, it was going to my heart, and they did the surgery. And it was devastating, to be honest with you. I didn't think I could make it without my leg because I didn't never had did that. You know, it's, I never imagined being without a leg. So it was really devastating. The problem is that there are people who are unable to obtain health care who need it. Regardless of what led them into that position, that's a fundamental problem. The way that our system is set up currently doesn't really allow um, for those patients. Those patients just fall through the cracks. Well, I had a triple bypass surgery back in uh, February 5th of 2008. Yeah, that's what started everything. Because, you know, I thought I was in good health. Then uh, after that, I wind up having COPD and uh, I still have a lot of problems with my breathing. You know, I have sleep apnea and uh, I had to uh, get a machine from uh, St. Vincent de Paul, you know, they you can go down there and get help. And I think here, I've got problems with my back, I've got deteriorating disc. I am also a diabetic and now I'm having a lot of problems with my knees. You know, it's hard to walk, 
if I turn my, if I leave my foot planted and I try to turn just a little bit one way, my knees just give out on me altogether, and that's really painful. So we're talking about 30 to 40 million patients spread out over the 300 million that have insurance. Um, they don't get care. They don't get care. They get sick. They go to the ER. Um, maybe they run from their bills. Maybe they get buried by them. They don't get preventative care. They don't. They, they don't get anything but late care. No, so most of the. Uh, most of the work that I've done, you know, they don't, they don't offer you any type of, any type of uh, medical. But if you want it, you know, you have to go out and get it on your own. And I didn't never have insurance taken out of my work because I never got sick and I didn't want to pay that extra cost. So I never got insurance. And I always worked in kitchens and the insurance was really high because you had to go outside, so to get the insurance. And after then, I got sick. I couldn't get it because... I had already been diagnosed with diabetes, so I had to go with the Hamilton County Health Insurance until I became disabled. We see everybody, um, regardless of their insurance status, and I think that's a great thing about where we work. So our clinic here at Hawksworth uh, provides a safety net. It's kind of a comprehensive safety net that uh, provides primary care uh, for patients, not just for acute issues, but for chronic issues and also for preventative health care issues. So, so our clinic uh, has always been a safety net practice, which means that if you don't have insurance or if you are one of the few people that are covered by the Hamilton County tax levy, our clinic has been there for you. Most of our patients are indigent, not all. Uh, there's a mixed variety of uh, people with insurance, some with private, not very many, uh, many with Medicare, Medicaid, and then there's the group that are depending on the tax levy uh, from Hamilton County. These are people who don't otherwise have insurance who would have no access to health care unless they paid out of pocket and most of them are unable to do so. And our clinic allows them to have access to a primary care provider to get all of their primary care needs as well as um, acute needs, instead of necessarily having to go to an emergency room, they can come to the clinic and um, pay a minimal, if anything, fee. Um, and also, our pharmacy provides prescriptions for 2 to $3. There are a lot of patients who end up at the university hospital, not necessarily by choice, but because that's the only place that they can find their care. And the Hawksworth actually really provides them with an outlet to get health care. You know, without insurance, many of the clinics around town won't take them. One of the main chief complaints of our patients is, why did you come here? And they say, because my doctor wouldn't see me anymore as I lost my insurance. It's very common. We've all heard that. I think people get private insurance and pretty much look down on people that go to the clinic because they, some people call it a free clinic, you know, and you go to a free clinic, they figure you're pretty much poor. I don't think that way. I think just most of them is good people just maybe in a bad situation where you just don't have the money for insurance, so you use that clinic. When you're 18 or 20, you're not thinking about, you know, what you're going to need at 40, 50, 60 years old, you know. You need to make sure that you got some kind of, you know, medical thing in place to where, you know, if something happens to you, you know, you've got help, you know, whether it's a... Uh, financial or you know family help or whatever you've got to you know just make sure that it you know like I said that it's set up and most people don't think about it I never did and now you know I have nothing to fall back on I was saying how people will do they will dump their garbage on the ground instead of and they're right here by the parking lot but they'll dump their garbage in, in, on, on, on the parking lot. I got to come out here and pick that up up there. But I usually come out every morning and pick it up. Depends on how I feel. If I feel good, I'll pick it up. If I don't, I'll let it go. My name is Grover W. Cash, and I'm 79 years old. I was born in 1931. I saw. I make clothes for people, I do alterations, make extra money, because what you get from Social Security, you have to do something to make up some extra money. I made my daughter's wedding dress, I made my mother and sister's wedding dress when I got married. 
I didn't make mine, but I've made other ones. And like I say, with my kids, they never got a store-bought dress till they was in, in junior high school because we couldn't afford to, to buy them, and I made them. Well, they started out for, for it back as I can remember, when they took the, they pulled, they took his five tumors off his spine. Then he started having seizures. I mean, he had them grand mal seizures. They put him on dilanthum and phenobarbital. He was on both of them for, I'd say, 10, maybe 15 years. Then the seizures eased up. Uh, then he had, um, he had um, polyps removed three times, and they take the polyps out about every four to five years, and they took them out once, and he swelled up like a balloon. And but like I say, with the help of the Lord, he came back. We just don't we don't give up. So it took him a long time to accept that he could not go out and work eight and 12 hours like he had been doing all his life. If I don't work, I guess, if I didn't work, I guess I'd, I'd die. I have to be doing something. I put myself in a position where I did hard work all my life and it's hard for me to sit down. And I go all the way around and I come back this way then I go up in the parking lot. With, with, with Humana and Medicare Part A, B, and D, and the help of the good man upstairs, we make it. We're leaning on God is the biggest thing. I think on another level that everyone, whether they have a job or not, whether they're indigent or not should be provided basic health care. I, I, I feel very strongly that it's, it's a person's right and it's the obligation of um, a, a community, a population to provide that. Every five years since 1966, the voters of Hamilton County have voted for what's, uh, what's called the indigent care tax levy uh, to cover those people who are residents of Hamilton County for their health care within the University Hospital and Children's Hospital. I believe there are just a few other counties in the entire country that have this type of arrangement. Um, and so for those people um, who have nothing, who really are destitute, this, this is a godsend. The Hamilton County tax levy is part of the taxation on property owners in the county. And this provides money if people qualify. Um, to help them with basic and emergency medical care and medications and studies um, during the period that they are between jobs or without insurance. So the only people in our county that don't get, that don't qualify, are the working poor. So there's, if you're dirt poor, you got nothing. You got no job, you got no money, you qualify. If you make a little bit of money, you don't qualify. So there's still a donut hole or a gap in there for patients uh, to come to our clinic. So if you work at McDonald's, for example, and you make too much money, can't qualify. So there's still a need. I mean, there's still people who just don't have anything. But for us in our practice, especially our practice, it's been, it's, it's one of the great things that we have. My name is Maddie Reed and I'm 64 years old. Oh, the mask, um, my youngest daughter Stephanie gave me a, a little bitty mask years ago and it hung on the wall for a long time and um, I just decided I was going to start collecting them after she gave me that so I've been, I still collect them if I can find one that I don't have. There's no uh, significance to them except I just like them. You know, it's just something I started and um, I don't know if it's got out of hand or not, but I'm still looking for some more. I'd like to have about three more rolls if I can get them. I have emphysema COPD, and uh, I was diagnosed with that uh, in my 40s.
Uh, she has COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and she has end-stage COPD, meaning she's on home oxygen and her activities are pretty limited. 2007, uh, July the 16th, is when I had a, a bad attack, and uh, I was in the hospital for five days, and when I came out, I was on oxygen, and I'm still on oxygen. Since then, um, I'm a homebody. I don't get out like I used to. You don't know if what uh, what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to get the flu and it triggers it, or a cold, or what is just happens when it happens. You don't know when it's coming. You don't know when it's coming. I go to the preliminary clinic at University Hospital, and they sent me to the rehab in Norwood, and I went there from August of 2007 till January 2008. And what they do, they teach you how to to cope with your disease also along with the lung doctors. My COPD, I use oxygen, as you know, this is my, my small tank. And I have a large tank I use when I do my exercises, when I do my cleaning of my house and stuff. And this is what they teach you. And then when you graduate out of the school and you come home in your home, you, they have exercises that you do in your home on a daily basis. and. I exercise seven days a week. I'm only allowed to use five pound weights, nothing heavier than five pound because it takes a lot of air. I have to do six in the back. One, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, six of those. I'm only going to do three of these. When you go to the rehab and they teach you how to exercise, you also Teach you how to breathe. You suck in, purse your lips, and you count to four. This is my exercise bike I use four days a week. I have to exercise on this ten minutes a day, but sometimes the 10 minutes turn anywhere between 20 minutes to a half an hour, depending on the breathing. But I do it uh, four days a week because it's part of my exercise regimen. Before I got sick, I was a very active person. Uh, I'm not as active now, but I'm still not going to give up. I feel like um, if I hadn't went to the rehab, I might have been the kind of person that would have gave up. But going to the rehab showed me that I can do the things that I did, be some of the things that I did before. As long as I'm here and keep doing what they tell me to do and keep on wanting to do, um, I think I'll be here for a while. I, I'm not ready to leave this earth. Today, you can have something today and not have it tomorrow. Like I said, I went to work one afternoon. That night I went to work, and next day I didn't have a leg. So, you know, I learned from that. that you can have something one day. I didn't think, even, I thought, I didn't think they were going to take it off. You know, I thought maybe they could do something to fix it. But it's gone. And you can't dwell over that. You got to keep going. You can't, if the leg gone, I can't stop. I got to keep moving. But the main thing I think that kept me focused with my children. It was real small and I didn't want them to see the devastation of it. I didn't want them to see me weak. I want to show them that 
It don't matter what happens to you in life, you can be something, you can move on. That was pushing me through school right now. It's that I want to get back into the workplace. I want to show them that, hey, just because you lost, something happened to you in life, that don't mean you give up. You got to keep going. When I got my leg amputated, I was like 71 all the time, wasn't doing anything, sitting on my. So I worked as a chef for a long time, so I was used to working. So after I did that, I sat around and you just watch people walk up and down the street, homeless people. I wake up in the morning, I see them sleeping on the sidewalk. That was right around here on the Ham Street where I used to live. And I had a caseworker to come, he used to handle all my business and things like that. So I asked her, I said, you know, is there anything I could do to kind of help people, you know, anything? I ain't gonna do nothing all day. She said, yeah, she said, why don't you go back to school and be a social worker, so you can do that. I said, nah, I ain't been in school in a long time. So after a while, I uh, just, you know, I said, fine, okay, I got it. I uh, applied for a grant, I got it. It just shocked me, you know, and then I went to Social Security to fill out this ticket to work program, and they gave me that. So I said, well, ain't nothing holding me back, so I might as well just go to school. So that was a year ago, now I've been there a year. Just at this, at the end of this semester, it'll be one year. And I've maintained a 3.0 grade point there, so one more year and I could uh, take a test, a uh, uh, state social worker's test. I feel that's the only way I could give back to the people that helped me is become one of the people that was helping me. And that's, to, be a, to help somebody and to give back, I think that's what gave me that try to do that. That I'm maybe one day can turn a person's life around because the lady at Center for Independence Living, I think she was the one that kind of turned my life around and kept me from just sitting around doing nothing. And I wish I could, somebody could remember me doing that to them like I remember her. Uh, it's like no matter what happened to you in life, don't give up. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up on the thing that you want to do in life because no matter what happened to you, your dream can still happen. And that's that's what I'm doing now. I'm just keep going. Just I'm keep going. And eventually it'll pay off in the long run. It may not, you may not I may not can see it now, but I know it's coming. If I keep working hard at it, I know one day I'm gonna be alright. It's based on how we view healthcare. Um, do we view healthcare as a business, or do we view it as a right? Um, I would substantiate that the people who view healthcare as a business would almost say there are no problems because it's a business. You know, businesses are meant to be profitable, and healthcare is no different than electricity. It's no different than, you know, gasoline. So, until we can wrench the business from medicine, it's going to be very difficult to enact a system in which people are doing good for other people just for the sake of doing good. It's always going to be financially motivated. Until everybody has enough, it's always going to be this conversation. Well, I, we off, when we talk about um, health care for the indigent, we often focus on the problems and, and they are important. But um, I want to also um, think about the things that, that our people do right with limited resources. Um, they endure incredible challenges sometimes. Um, social violence, family distress, uh, financial problems, but still take care of their family, uh, often take in other family members, um, we have many, many elderly who are raising grandchildren and even great-grandchildren. Spouses that are taking care of their sick spouse. Uh, we often uh, load these poor caregivers with all of these instructions. Um, you know, a 55-year-old woman with her 70-year-old sick husband who has, does not have much education or medical sophistication is being expected to give medicines four times a day, do three times a day treatment, give him the right diet, and rise to the occasion and do wonderful jobs. These are strong people, and I admire them.